sake. We are f finishing up our series today called A Christmas Playlist. We've gone through some Christmas carols and, and looked at some different songs. And today is Fifth Sunday. You're going to get used to hearing this Fifth Sunday. On the fifth Sunday of a month, if the month has five Sundays, we're going to be combining our high school a program and our adult program every fifth Sunday, all right? Uh, the youth of our church is one of our main focuses. And so today, I will speak for about 15 minutes, and then I'll turn the service over to Pastor Josh, who is our youth pastor, and he'll close out with another 15 minutes, all right? But we're looking at the song today, We Three Kings. We Three Kings. The original name for the song was Three Kings of Orient, uh, or they also had another name called The Quest of the Magi. It's this Christmas carol written by John Henry Hopkins Jr. in 1857. At the time of him composing the carol, Hopkins served as the rector of the Christ Episcopal Church in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And he wrote the carol, check this out, this is interesting. He wrote the carol to be part of a Christmas pageant that he was hosting in New York City. It's pretty cool, huh? Uh, many versions of this song have been composed and it remains a very popular Christmas carol today. We get the story of these three kings or these wise men or these magi in the book of Matthew chapter two. And I wanna take a look at that today. And it's kind of a long story, so I'm going to read it to you, right? It goes like this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, magi, wise men, three kings from the east, came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? Now listen, if you're the current king, and someone comes looking for the king of the Jews, you're not in a good situation. You're not in a happy moment, okay? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will, be sh who will shepherd my people Israel. Herod was not happy about this. Some other king trying to move in on my turf, right? Then Herod called the Magi secretly, and found out from them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report back to me so that I may go and worship him as well. Kids, did he really want to go worship him? No. no. This is a setup. Say setup. Setup. Set up. Come on, kids. It's a setup. Set yeah, it's a setup. Herod wants to know where this king of the Jews is, not so he can go worship him, but that he can take him out, okay? After they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed, on coming to the house, we got to understand, they did not go to the manger scene, all right? Jesus was probably around three years old at this time. So they're showing up to Mary and Joseph's house, probably a split level, by level, probably something like they live in Middletown, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts. I love Christmas gifts. Yo. All right, let me ask you a question real quick. By a raise of hands, at Christmas time, do you go around the room and each person opens their gift one at a time? How many of you, it's just straight mayhem, everybody's opening gifts same time? 
Oh, okay. How many of you are not going to raise your hand no matter what I say? Okay. <laughs> they presented gifts of gold. Yes! That meant money. A money. Of gold. Listen, when you don't know what to buy somebody, I really don't like, just so you guys know, unless it's a Starbucks gift card, I don't actually like gift cards. Because then you're stuck spending your money on what that person thinks you need. Right? Cash. Cash money, right? That's what it is. Gold. It wasn't a gift card. It wasn't, it wasn't a Walmart gift card. It wasn't a Target gift card. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I was going to get into some detail about what each of those stood for and what they were used for in the time, but we don't have time to go in that today. Maybe another time. Watch. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Okay? The first truth that I want to point out here is that nowhere in Scripture did it say that there were three wise men. Nowhere in Scripture did it say three magi from the east came to find Jesus. There could have been a hundred of them. There could have been three or two of them. There could have been a gazillion. We don't know. The only reason why theologians believe that there was three was because of there was three gifts. There was gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But wonder if there were six kings and they had two gifts of gold, two gifts of frankincense, and two gifts of myrrh. We don't know. We don't know the amount of people. And let's just be honest. If you were transporting an entire cart of gold, you're going to have some bodyguards. You're going to have some bodyguards. So at least you had the three kings and their bodyguards. Come on, let's just be honest. The next truth I want to point out to you is this. Even God the Father sent his child support. Come on, somebody, you got that. You got that. Even God the Father paying his kids' bills on child support. Don't be no bum skipping out on your kid's child support. God the Father said, I'm going to dress my kid with gold, frankincense, and some mar. I thought it was going to go over a little bit better than that. I don't know where we get the belief that Jesus was raised poor. He came into the earth by means of poverty. He was born in a manger having no room for his head. Truth. But in this moment, we have no idea the amount of riches that were just dropped on him. For some reason, I don't even know who made the manger scene anyway. <laughs> but somebody made the manger scene, put the three wise men there. They weren't there. And then they put this little tiny, like, glass case box. Gold. Listen, I'm telling you right now, a little box of gold this big isn't enough to write a Bible story about. These men, however many there were, it was probably an entourage of a hundred or more people. They traveled between 750 and 1,000 miles to get to him. They're not traveling that far to bring him a $5 gift card. <laughs> they brought carts and chariots of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I'm telling you right now, God the Father funded his son's entire ministry and calling at his birth. Yeah. <laughs> Pastor Mike, I don't believe all that. I don't think it was that much. I don't think he was that. Jesus wore a priestly garment. A priestly garment, if you do your study, was the most expensive garment you could wear. The, the, the hems and the seams were sewn with gold. Where did he get the gold? They brought gold, 
frankincense, and myrrh. Come on, somebody. The Bible tells us this, that a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. Today, I want to look at who were these wise men. We, in some Christian circles, they have given these three wise men names. In fact, January 6th is a celebratory Three Kings Day. We don't know there was three kings. I don't even know where people got their names from. Like you literally can't figure that out by looking at scripture. But what I believe is this, the reason why there is no names, and it doesn't say that there was only three kings, is because this is an all-inclusive story that every single one of us that will bring our gifts to the Lord are wise men. Are wise men. If we would bring our giftings and our talents and our callings to the Lord, he calls us wise men men. Our song sings this, we three kings of Orient are, bearing gifts we traverse afar, field and fountain, moor and mountain, follow the yonder star. Yeah. <laughs> I had to look up the word Orient because I had no idea what it's talking about. It simply means someone from the east. We three kings of the east are bearing gifts and we travel far. You know what's funny today is that the average church goer will not drive more than 15 minutes to attend church. <laughs> I ain't hating online, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. These dudes travel like a thousand miles to get a glimpse of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we have him accessible in city after city, town after town, church after church. And we really don't feel the need to get a glimpse of Jesus. They traveled east following a star. We have to understand these magi were pretty much astrologers. They were students and and professionals of the stars. Every day they would look and study the stars and what the stars were telling them. And all of a sudden, this foreign star appears. It drew their attention. And what does this mean? What is this star? They had to look at prophecies and and, and tales as to what this thing is that they're seeing. And now they just pack up and start following this star. Like Pastor Mike style and how I write, I have a question for you today. What is the guiding star in your life? What is the guiding star in your life? What are you chasing? What are you chasing after? Some of you in here, you you used to have a lifestyle that kept chasing the next high. The next high. You kept chasing the next fix. And whatever that was, maybe it wasn't drugs or alcohol, but maybe it was the next thrill, the next adrenaline rush. He kept chasing after something. Like Pastor Josh, he's chasing girls. He's trying to get married. Pastor Josh, single. He got his binoculars out. He's looking. Pastor Josh, 23-year-old single guy, you know, trying to get his focus back on Jesus, but he's trying to find wifey. <laughs> His phone number is 845. <laughs> <laughs> What's the guiding star in your life? Some of us chase success. Some of us, some of us there's, this, there's this term, are paper chasers, money chasers, right? What's the guiding star? What is the thing that you feel that if I accomplish this, I acquire, some of, you, some of us, it's education. We can't have enough degrees. You got like six master's degrees and, and like seven doctorates. 
and, and, and still, well, one day I'll feel like I'm accomplished. What's the guiding star in your life? Because wise men and women will follow the thing, wise men and wise women will follow the thing that leads them to a deeper relationship with Jesus. Wise men and wise women will follow the thing that leads them to a deeper relationship with Jesus. Unwise people will allow the busyness of life, the cares of this world, to pull them away from Jesus. Come on. We understand that wise men still follow the guiding light that leads to Jesus. But it can be so easy to be distracted. It can. I was seriously distracted this morning, walking in, seeing the children's ministry flooded with fuel oil. I mean, the smell was just like nauseating. I was like, we're going to have to cancel church today. We're going to have to cancel church today. And then I began to bug out. Like, I don't know if, I don't know, I like, I write stories in my mind so that I get all flustered, I get all panicky, and I'm like, we're going to have to get to church today. And, and like, it's not only the last Sunday of the year, it's the last Sunday of the decade. Yeah. We start a new decade. And I'm like, I can't not have church. I lost another Sunday. <laughs> and then I got myself so worked up, I was like, no. You know, you get yourself, oh, now I don't even want to preach. <laughs> it's so easy to get pulled away from serving God. It's so easy to get pulled away from spending time with the Lord. And watch this. In Ephesians 5.15, it says this. Be very careful. Be wise. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Now, when Paul wrote this, it was still really nice there. Could you imagine how much more evil the days must be than when he wrote this? I mean, just turn on some politics and you see some evil fights going on. Come on, I'm just saying. He's saying that days are short. Have you heard yourself say that? Man, why does it seem like the day just goes by so fast nowadays? Like 20 years ago, I felt like I could accomplish so much. Well, you were also 20 years younger. (laughs) Just remember, you probably moved a little faster, right? But it does. It seems like the days are shorter and shorter. He said, so live as wise making the most of every opportunity. Now check this out. King James defines the word wisdom as this. Wisdom is the correct use or exercise of knowledge. My dad raised me saying like this. Wisdom is the correct application of knowledge. Is correctly applying knowledge. That's what wisdom is. But can we just ask another question? Just think about this for a second. How can I apply something I don't have? If wisdom is the correct application of knowledge and I don't have the knowledge, I can't apply it, I can't be wise. Did that intellectually make sense? Do we understand that? Right? So I can't have wisdom when it comes to the Bible or the things of God if I don't know the Bible. I can't have wisdom when it comes to my vehicle if I don't know anything about my vehicle. Come on, let's just think about this for a second. I can't be wise as a parent if I never read anything about parenting. Because wisdom is the correct application of knowledge. We have to be obtaining knowledge. That is not God's job, that's yours. I asked for a service this. What's your reading list for 2020? What's your reading list for 2020? What's your book list? Did you already order them on Amazon? Do you have them in your cart? Here's a, here's a startling statistic, no shame here, but just listen, 80% of men never read a book after college. Yeah, yep, I'm not a reader, I'm not a reader. Leaders are readers. 
you want to grow in your industry? You want to grow in your field? You want to be a leader? You want to make more money? Read a book about your job. <laughs> no, no. You want to really grow the business? You really want a promotion? Read a book about your boss's job. I'm just saying, listen to what I'm trying to tell you here. You obtaining wisdom's not God's job. It's yours. It's your job to obtain knowledge, to become wise. If you don't, ha listen, I'm just going to say it right now, and I'm about to turn it over to Josh. You'd be mad at him. <laughs> if you don't have a reading list of like 12 books this year, you're going to repeat 2019. You'll repeat 2019 because you haven't decided to do anything to make 2020 any different. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing the same way, thinking you're going to get a different result. What's going to be any different about 2020 just because it's a new year? Well, God's in control. He's going to change it. But he said, you obtain knowledge. Obtain, here's another one. The Bible says this, God has given you the ability to create wealth. But we got to go do it. We got to go do it. So what does wisdom look like? What is wisdom? And we're going to have Pastor Josh take it from here. Thank you, thank you. So yes, my name is Pastor Josh. If you're saying to yourself, I've been to church three times this year, I ain't never seen him. He's not a pastor. The reason you don't see me a lot is I'm upstairs with the teenagers as the youth pastor, hence the ripped jeans and whatnot, all that fun stuff. So today we're talking about this idea of wisdom and that wise men still follow God today. Say that with me. Say, wise men, wise men. still follow God, still follow God. Today. today. Now look at somebody next to you, look them in their eyes and tell them, wise men, still follow God today. And what I love about this thing called wisdom is wisdom is one of those areas that if we can grow and improve in that one spot, it'll improve all areas of our lives. So wisdom is a very important topic today. So we heard about the wise men. Let's look into the Bible and see some other places on how we can apply wisdom in our lives. So I want to start with a scripture from the book of Proverbs. And this book of Proverbs is also known as the book of wisdom. So there's a lot of little nuggets of wisdom in there. And in Proverbs chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, the Bible says this, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I'm going to read that again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For through wisdom, your days will be many and years will be added to your life. If you are wise, your wisdom will reward you. And then we get a warning. It says, if you are a mocker, tell your neighbor, tell him, don't be a mocker. Don't be a mocker. You alone will suffer. Who here wants to suffer? Keep your hands down. Good, 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 good. So if you're like me and you hear this scripture that says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, you think of fear as a negative emotion. You think of fear as being afraid of someone or being afraid of something that wants to hurt you. And that's not a good thought. When I hear this word fear, I think of that time when I was 10 years old and I was at summer camp and it was the last day of camp and this bully was telling people that he's going to fight me. He was like, it's the last day of camp. I'm not going to get suspended. I'm not going to get in trouble. So I'm going to fight this kid today. And he told multiple people that. So I did what every smart 10-year-old does, and I enlisted the Secret Service. <laughs> now, the Secret Service consisted of my older brother, and older brothers come with older friends. So I was good all day. I was going to tennis. I got eyes on. You got him? Yep, Johnny. Just keep an eye on, keep an eye. The eagle is leaving the nest. I repeat, the eagle is leaving the nest. I was good. I was protected that whole day. But when I think of fear, that's what I think of. 
that feeling of I need to hide from this person because they're going to harm me. I need to hide from somebody because they want to damage me. And many of us think this way when it comes to this idea, the fear of God. We think that we have to be afraid of a big angry God because he's seeking out to hurt us. But as we study this scripture a little bit deeper, we can truly uncover the meaning of that word fear. So this book of Proverbs was originally written in the Hebrew language, which we then translated to English. And the word here that they use for the word fear is the word yira. Say it with me. Say yira. Yira. Now, some of us went to Pine Bush and we said, yeehaw. That's not what I'm saying. I went there too. Don't worry. I'm a Pine Bush graduate as well. It's this word yira, Y-I-R-A-H. And while that word can mean to be afraid of, it can also mean this, to live in awe of, to live with respect of, to live in reverence of. In short terms, this is what it's saying. It's saying yira means to put somebody in their rightful place, to respect them at such a level that you give them the honor and the respect that they are due. So if we look at that scripture through that lens, it's not saying being afraid of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's saying that respect and reverence and awe of God is the beginning of wisdom. And we see this lived out with those wise men, that they put Jesus in his right place as king, that they respected him and they lived in awe of him. They worshiped him and they put him at the head of their lives. And maybe you're here today and you know that you're smarter than God. You watch every Tony Robbins speech that he's ever done. You got all the motivational books. You read for 10 minutes a day. You so wise, you got those pants with the zipper on the knee so that when it's hot outside, you unzip it, bam! I got shorts now. You just really smart. Well, if you're here today and you know that you're smarter than God, I have a quote for you from this guy named Socrates, and he said this. He said, there's two types of people in the world. There are the wise people who know that they are fools, and there are the foolish people who know that they are wise. If you're here today and you know that you have all the answers, ain't nobody can ever tell you nothing, you lack wisdom. If you're here today and you think, God doesn't know best, I know best. Man, what's God talking about? That's outdated, man. You lack wisdom. Because the creator of the universe is the source of the wisdom. And for us to gain wisdom, it starts by acknowledging who God is and living in reverence and honor to God, putting him in his right place in our lives. So this idea of the fear of God being the beginning of wisdom, it's not just seen with the wise men. It's not just in the book of Proverbs. We also see it in the book of Joshua, chapter 24. So the context of this passage that we're about to read is that this guy named Joshua was leading God's people for a long time, and he was leading them well. Before he dies, God speaks through him one last time. And God sort of outlines all the good things that he's done for the people of Israel, his people. And then after God is done speaking through Joshua, he gives Joshua the microphone. He says, say what you want to say right before he dies. And this is what Joshua says. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 14, he says this. Now fear the Lord. Now fear the Lord. Put God in his right place and serve him with all faithfulness. He then says, throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. Now all he's saying there is choose the one true God or keep serving the false gods. And he's encouraging them to follow the one true God. And then he ends with this powerful statement. He then says, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to read that again. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now, parents, let me talk to you for a second. That was not an option. 
It wasn't asked for me and my household, if my kids want to get up and go to church, then we'll serve the Lord. It was no. Asked for me and my house, we're going to church. As for me and my house, I know that there are certain things that they need to be hearing. So he made the decision that we are going to serve the Lord. Now there's loud amens with a Jamaican accent over here. <laughs> and I know that that man brought me to church every single week. It was not an option. It wasn't a choice. And because he made me go to church, it wasn't a choice. Guess what? I love church. I get to work at a church. It's the best job ever, in my opinion. No hate to any other jobs. I love what I get to do. And that's come from a decision from one person to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So this guy, Joshua... He's in his final moments on this earth, and he gives us two great pieces of wisdom. The first thing he says is fear God. He's saying put God in his rightful place at the head of your lives. Live with honor and with reverence to God. And then secondly, he says this. He says walk away from the false gods. He says put away the false gods. Get away from those things that distracted you in 2019. And even though this passage was written thousands of years ago, and it was copied over and over and over again to the point where it's now on a screen that's sliding up in front of me, I believe that this passage is just as relevant today as it was thousands of years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. That all of us have an opportunity to say, you know what? I'm going to walk away from some of those false gods this year. I'm going to walk away from those things that have held me back. Maybe we've seen a false god called anger, and we've struggled with that this year. Where when there's guests coming over, we go ballistic. Did you mop the roof? Did you vacuum the gutter? The couch, just throw the couch away. We don't have time. They're coming. Let's go. Maybe it's this false god called laziness. Oh, 6 a.m. I should get up, read my Bible. You know what? Just five more minutes. And you snooze for five more minutes, and you close your eyes for five minutes, and you open your eyes, and it's now 8.30, and you scramble out of bed. Got to get to work. And let me tell you, me too. I'm a pastor, and there's mornings when I just want to snooze and snooze and snooze. It happens. Maybe there's this false god called a bad attitude. And I'm not going to say any names, but sometimes I see this upstairs. Well, good morning. How are you? Good. <sighs> Get out of my face. You're always trying to hug me and talk to me. Get out of my face. <laughs> Why well, always, ah, ah. Are you okay? Ah. What language is that? Is that French, German? I don't speak, ah. <laughs> Maybe. And this is another struggle I've had. There's this false God called unforgiveness. Where when we should be happy for somebody or enjoying ourselves, we're not. Because we have unforgiveness in our hearts. We're in a place where we can't even be happy for somebody doing something great with their life because something they did 30 years ago. And we're handing somebody else the keys to our life. The key to a good day because of our own issues. And maybe as I'm here today talking about moving forward in life and doing better in 2020, maybe you're saying, you know what? It's a cool idea, but look at my past. Look at all these mistakes that I've made. How could I for one second say I'm going to move forward when I have all these mistakes in the past? But one thing that I love about God is that God isn't a one and done God. It's not I made one mistake and he's done with me. It's not, I messed up in the past, and he's done with me. That's why he sent his son Jesus to deal with our past, and not just our past, but also our present and our future. He's forgiven all of our mistakes and given us the ability to move forward. So if you're here today and you're saying, my past is defining me, that's your choice. But you also have the choice to say this, that my past failures do not determine my future. I do.
all of us here today have the same power that Joshua had, that these people had to make a decision to use wisdom and to put God in his rightful place. And I'll remind you again that we serve a gracious and a good God that even if we feel like our entire life has been full of mistakes, that doesn't matter anymore. What matters is how are we going to look forward this year? How am I going to make a decision to put God in his rightful place? Because wise men still follow God today. Now, all of us here today are in a moment where we have access to God's grace and access to God the Father through his son named Jesus. But once again, that's a decision that's left up to us. Like Pastor Mike was saying, wisdom is our job. He's not going to give us the knowledge. He's not just going to say, here, downloading into your brain. That's not how it works. We have a role to play. And the same thing is true in our walks with Jesus, that we have a role to play. So I want to pray today, first and foremost, for anybody that feels like they could use a little bit of wisdom in 2020. You're saying, you know what, pray for me. If that's you, could you wave at me? I'd love to pray for you. Just about everybody. Let's pray. Father, I come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you that you're giving us wisdom, that you're guiding us. Lord, I thank you that we would have the strength in 2020 to follow your voice Whether we followed you 10,000 times or this is going to be the first time, Lord, I thank you that we would follow after you, that we would make a decision to do the things that you've called us to do, that we would walk away from those distractions and fix our eyes on you, putting you in your right place in our lives as first and as God. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. And I want to pray for a second group today. For those of you who are here and you've never made a decision for Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior, and we all say this prayer together, it goes like this. Dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose again for me. Come into my life. Come into my heart to change me and to make me new. I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, if you prayed that for the first time, can you wave at me real quick? I don't want to embarrass you. Is there anybody over here? One. Over here. Over here. Over here. Amen. Over here in the back. If you made a decision today to follow Jesus for the very first time, we have a book on the seats in front of you called Welcome Home. That will walk you through the first steps of your Christian journey. Let me pray for you guys before we head out. Father, I come to you today in Jesus' name. And, Lord, I thank you that we would all have a great week. I thank you, Lord, that you're blessing us and keeping us safe as we're going out back into the world. I thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.